long as we get away from centralization. Once we do that, we begin to build the law on a foundation that can expand and that doesn't turn into a dominance hierarchy where law is enforced by the big guy with the big sword. So we can do this. And the reason I know we can do it and that it works is because I was involved in a fairly early cypherpunk project where we did this and we created it from scratch and it worked. So the project was, was called Laissez Faire City, and it began, oh, I got involved in about 1999 and ended up flying back and forth to Costa Rica, where our headquarters were. And it's a very long, entertaining, was a, a gas of a story. Uh, you can find it if you're interested in a, a book I, I wrote a couple years ago called The Untold Story of the Greatest Crypto Project Ever. It's on uh, Kindle on Amazon. You can find it if you want. But what happened was we created uh, actually two different systems of anonymous or pseudonymous internet commerce. And we began to realize that we, there were problems coming up. Uh, people misunderstood each other. People didn't really come to a clear agreement on things. A couple people were just kind of jerks. And we had to deal with this to keep our markets going because it was becoming a problem. So myself and a few other people who, who assisted me in various things uh, came up with models of doing this and quickly cobbled together various ways of making this thing work. And it did work. It worked really well. Uh, the story is in the little book that I wrote, uh, but it worked exceptionally well under some fairly difficult conditions. You know, the kind of conditions they say, well, you can never have law without, uh, without government force because, you know, the strongest would just take over and so on. Well, we kind of had that situation and the strongest lost. So, it really can work. Um, let me explain to you the parts of this system, how we built it uh, and how it worked. The first part was pseudonymous identity. It turns out you really can't do business anonymously on the internet for the simple reason that you need reputation. Reputation is crucial. You want people to know who you are that you have a reputation that you do good business and people trust you. This is really important. So we found out that we really can't do anonymous because you lose all your reputation. Uh, I did good business 45 times and everybody trusts me. And if it's just really anonymous, nobody knows. So we came up with ways of doing pseudonymous. Uh, you make a, a fake name and use that name. Uh, the easiest way to just do it is, is using a hash or a PGP key that nobody can forge. Uh, but there are other ways, and, and guys, of course, did them with cute little icons and so on and so forth. But it was crucial that, we, that reputation followed us because if you do good business again, you want people to know that you have, and they want people to know who you are. So we did that. We also had trusted arbitrators, people that would make decisions on things. And it had to be somebody who was trusted because trust really is what replaces violence on enforcement. So under the traditional sorts of nation state systems we have now, things, justice is secured by the ability to use violence, to send policemen, to grab people and take them and lock them in a cage or to shake money out of them to pay back the guy. Ultimately, it's enforced with violence. If you don't have that, you need community enforcement, ostracism and so on, and you need trust because you have to have somebody who makes a decision that says, look, I've checked all the facts on this. John gave me all his facts. Jane gave me all her facts. I've looked at it. 
I've listened to their arguments and this is done. So, and then the community has to respect that. So this is really the thing that matters. Uh, so you need to replace violence with trust. And we do that by having a, a reasonably a trusted arbitrator putting out thought out opinions. And like I say, it really did work and very well. Now, another thing we put together are statements or the principles of justice. And we use, we created them and it's called the Common Economic Protocols. You can find the uh, final version up at anarplex.net. Uh, if you don't know what the NRplex is, it's a good place. You should go take a look around. It's nrplex.net. And if you look in the, I think it's in the files section, you can find the common economic protocols. And that's a set of 20, 26, if I recall, principles of justice. These are the things that our justice stood upon. This is what we believe. This is what we will choose based upon so everybody knows what it is. That was very important. And it was a, a crucial job to put it together. The next thing we used was a contract registry. And this is an odd concept for us these days because we do justice after the fact. That is, I do business with you and I don't really think about the justice process at all. It, it, when we get to the end, if God forbid something breaks down, then we go to the lawyers or to the court or whatever. When you, fi you find when you're doing justice without force that you have to do something ahead of time. And so what we did is we created a contracts registry and we also created arbitration clauses that were put in the contracts. And it was very easy and very brief. These days, I'm sure you would just put it in an automated contract if you're going to use one of the uh, crypto systems that automates contracts. You would just put it right in the beginning and say, you know, any problems with this will be handled by such and such arbitrator according to the Common Economic Protocols, version 1.1, boom, done. Uh, that was necessary to get that resolved in front, what will happen. And it's, like I say, it's not hard. And it's the type of thing really would be a good idea to just write into any automated contracts. Uh, so we did that. And the other thing we found out was we had a, we developed a very strong pre preference for mediation rather than arbitration. Arbitration is a lot more like a court case, like the traditional court case we think of in, in nation state law, where you present your sides and the arbitrator, essentially a judge, comes up with a verdict and publishes it. In mediation, you say, look, John, Jane was expecting this from you and didn't get it. She only got two thirds of it. Jane, John thought this, and this is how I think we should divide it and everybody get back to work. And you find out that in almost all cases between reasonable adults, you can pull something like this off. It's a job. It's tricky. It requires uh, a lot of thought and effort. But the purpose of this whole thing is, again, not to execute justice and law and punish the evildoers. It's to keep everybody creative. It's to keep everybody productive and keep them working. So mediation, we found out, was really the thing you want. You want to go to, to the arbitrator and have him or her sit down and work out the process. So everybody ends up coming out of it reasonably happy or at least not too unhappy and goes back to work. That's what we want. So we found out that that was really very important. Um, one of the things that we did not get to build, uh, that it was difficult and took a lot of time was what we called a web of trust. And that is a, a computer program, a, a, maybe a service, it depends how you want to do it. I, I've got uh, a graphic or two on it of who trusts whom and how much do they trust whom. And every node on this little, on this web, on this chart, every intersection is a node and every, everything else, every line connects to someone else. And I rate Bobby a 95%. I think he's wonderful. Uh, 
another friend rates Bobby so-and-so percent and a hundred other people rate Bobby very highly. And as a result, he has a 96% trust figure. Well, you can be pretty sure that you're going to be all right if you do business with this guy. Somebody else may only have a, an overall trust number of 45. Well, that person you want to be careful. Maybe you acquire some money up front or whatever. But we wanted this web of trust and you can do it all sorts of ways. You can anonymize it. Uh, you can uh, sell access to it. The person who operates this thing certainly deserves to get paid for it. Uh, so there's ways of doing it. And there was another idea we had that we called a bonding web. And we didn't build this one either. Again, these were these are hard things to build and more so in 20 years ago. Uh, remember, this is all going on in 1999, 2000, and 2001. Uh, so it wasn't as easy as things are now. We didn't have the tools that we have now. But a bonding web was almost the same thing where I put up, you know, 5,000 Satoshis and put them into escrow for my friend, Jim. And somebody else likes Jim a lot and puts up 10,000 Satoshis, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and so we bond each other. We're providing trust in advance saying, I know this guy. I'll put 5,000 Satoshis at risk for this guy. I know him. And so if you do business with this person, you can then know that there are 100,000 Satoshis that people have put up and an arbitrator that you're choosing. And if this arbitrator decides that this guy really screwed you over, you've got access to all that crypto as recompense for it. So it's, it's a bond of sorts. And you can do this massively parallel. It can be done. Uh, and it can be done, again, a lot easier now than it was 20 years ago. But it can be done, and it's a really good idea, in my humble opinion. Another thing we wanted to put together was a Justice Providers Association. That is, all the arbitrators, I wanted them to get together and to be able to share their findings, like they did in the old common law, where a judge would look at a particular case, and if it was an important one, they would write their findings and send them to the other judges so they had them and they could review them. Uh, I wanted to do that same thing. We did do it just a little bit uh, but because of complex reasons. It didn't last very long. Uh, not that there was any particular problem with it. It's just, you know, these things are always complicated. When you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of human beings, it gets complicated. Um, another thing we did have and built was an escrow service. And you could buy something and put money in escrow. And when it was delivered and we had verifications from Federal Express and UPS and so on, then the money was released. You could do this much more easily today uh, than, than the way we had to hard code everything uh, in the old days. Uh, but it's also an important piece, a really nice tool to create trust in advance. So you don't wait till the end and you've got to go to a centralized provider who's always going to get out of control because they're the only authorized user of violence. And this way you can do it in advance very easily and avoid all of the problems that come with centralization. One other thing that we didn't implement, uh, I wrote a paper on it. We didn't implement it. We didn't need to. Uh, was outlawry. Outlawry in, the, outlawry in the old days was not just calling somebody a bad guy, oh, he's an outlaw. That's the way it's usually meant now, but that's not what it meant in the original. What it meant was, you can, this man is outside of the law. In other words, outside of civilized society. And if I, a trusted arbitrator or judge, write a writ of outlawry against this guy, Anybody who wants to can take his stuff. So if I found out that somebody had hacked into uh, Jimmy's account and stole four Bitcoins, and I go through the whole process of, of you know, verifying everything and coming up with a, a decision, and I issue a writ of outlawry and people trust me, then I could say, look, anybody who wants to can go take four Bitcoins plus 
so much for your efforts. And if you deliver those four Bitcoins to Jimmy who got ripped off, you can keep the rest and we will thank you. That's how outlawry works. We didn't get a chance to implement it. We didn't need to implement it, thank God. Uh, but it is a legitimate process. Remember, when you're getting to this level, you're dealing with some pretty ugly stuff. And you want to repair the damage. The best way to keep everybody working and everybody producing. Uh, so that is something that exists. We didn't really get a chance to do it, but it, it, it was there. Oh, one other thing I should add. We use the model of the common law for this. There are other models that could have been used. There have been plenty of uh, decentralized or non-centralized uh, justice systems in the past. The law merchant of the Middle Ages uh, was a big one. Uh, Jewish law always is, is still going on. Um, but we decided to use uh, the common law. Uh, one, of the re one of the things that we got from it that is also up at Anarplex is the maxims of law. And we posted those up there. Again, anarplex.net, you can find them, dig around. And these are 30 some pages of uh, findings from the common law in the old days. Uh, it's important to note that the common law was the law of judges, not of legislation. There was really no legislation as we think of it, or very, very little of, until about 1800. Uh, especially in English speaking countries, the common law was the law of judges. So we put the maxims up there. I edited them, removed all of the references to you know, state power and such, and put them up there. Uh, they are really useful. Anybody who's serious about this really needs to read them. It's important. All right, let's go just a couple things. Uh, we're doing okay on time. I wanna talk about why we use the common law. And the common law, not terribly well understood, but it formed in conditions of anarchy. So the power of the classical era, Rome fell or actually kind of disintegrated in the fifth, sixth, seventh centuries. And most of Europe were in conditions of anarchy. Uh, they, the history books talk about kings and so on. Uh, and of course there were, in Ireland there were a hundred kings at the same time. Uh, these were not kings like we would talk about nowadays. These were traveling bands uh, and where the king wasn't, power wasn't. And uh, so the king traveled with his court and, and moved from place to place all the time. And again, where, where, where the king wasn't, there was no power and it was conditions of anarchy. Um, so the common law formed in this period in England. Uh, and it was the law of custom. You can even see the, the earlier kings, even until the, uh, the Norman conquest and after, talking about the law of custom. We're gonna respect the law of custom. Well, this is the, the common law that was formed in, in all these little towns during this condition of semi-anarchy or near anarchy or total anarchy in some places um, by people who needed justice in real life. And they appointed old people that they respected to, to come up with verdicts and they became the judges and they shared their verdicts. It's the same basic thing we're doing now. And the judges, the purpose of the judge was to decide, decide what was just in each particular case. And if it was an important case or they had stumbled upon an important principle of justice, they sent it to the other judges so they could see it. And this, again, is what ends up in our maxims of law. Again, there was no legislation. This was all principle driven. Uh, and we have a long and rich record of it. So we have from them refined and tested principles. Remember, this was, these were the principles of law developed over centuries. So you find that human life is, is exceptionally complicated. Humans do all kinds of things. And so we have records of all the best principles of law from the common law, which is, depending how you count it, you know, four, eight, 10 centuries, 
we'd be fools to just ignore that. All that experience, all that learning, all of those applications, we have it. We can use it. It's not hard. So that's really that was really an important thing. Now, before I run out of time here, I want to talk about something that's important for right now with people automating contracts. So there's a really important thing, especially as we're getting into automated contracts and things like that, that we have to understand something, the difference between the mechanical and the organic. Uh, here's what I mean. Ever since, oh, the Enlightenment era, uh, began with Kepler and Newton and, and all of the people who worked with them, uh, that they began to figure out how the universe worked. And they found out that it worked by math, which was, you know, a miracle. It was unbelievable. It was, it was tremendous. But as a result, people began to think that all the world, all the universe is mechanical and everything in it is mechanical and we can see the world as mechanical and we ought to see the world as mechanical. That's overstated. Now, here, here's the thing. The mechanical model is wonderful for science. Again, we found out the whole universe works by math. Oh my God. So it's hugely applicable there. And it's applicable for machines and it's applicable for very many, many types of analysis. Humans, however, are not mechanical. We're organic. So while the mechanical model is wonderful for whole ranges of things, it's not particularly wonderful for us. We don't operate. Machines are built, they operate at a steady state, and then they break usually catastrophically and very, very quickly. Humans, organisms form, they grow, they expand. They're composed of dozens of simultaneous processes, all of which balance each other. We have this thing in biology called homeostasis that means for every process, there's something that turns it on and there's something that turns it off. And both the turn on and the turn off are working at the same time, balancing each other, not to mention balancing over against the other dozen systems. So applying a mechanical model to an organism doesn't really work. So when we start automating contracts, that involve humans, we have to provide an out. We have to provide some sort of process in advance that applies to exceptions. Because again, human, human action is so complicated and so vast that whatever rules you write, if it applies to humans, eventually there's gonna be an exception to the rule and People are going to be really unhappy or things will go badly if you don't have some way to fix it. The way to fix it is dispute resolution, aka commercial justice. So we have to have these things in our automated contracts um, because eventually problems will come and they'll, they'll make people uh, want to turn away from it because there's no recourse. Um, so and you can do it on a, on a simple betting market, I'm sure, but when you get more complicated, it gets to be a problem. Also, when we get automated contracts between machines that are complicated enough, it's going to make problems. There's something, uh, those of you who, who, who like uh, such things, math and systems, know of Goodell's theorems. And that Goodell uh, mathematician, uh, in the 20th century, found out that any system uh, that has enough axioms, enough decisions, enough choices in it, if it's complicated enough, it is either wrong or it, um, oh, what's the right way to say it? Uh, it, it will have problems. It, it, it either self-contradicts itself or has gaps. Um, so uh, math guys, forgive me for stating that poorly. Uh, I don't have all my notes in front of me, um, but it's a problem. Uh, so contracts that are complex enough will break. 
Uh, so you also, for them, need some type of recourse uh, so that we can fix these things and, again, keep everybody moving forward. We want to do things the simplest possible way, uh, and that at some point requires us to have a justice system in place so we can um, solve these problems as they occur before they become bigger problems and spread. Uh, I hope that makes good sense to everybody, but it really is necessary. Now, I got one more thing I really want to talk about. This will take a few minutes. And this is to those of you who are interested in this topic and who think maybe that you would like to be involved with doing something like this. First of all, I can tell you from my limited experience and, and long time ago experience, uh, that it's immensely rewarding uh, if you can do it. It's scary and it's hard and you write your, your findings when you need to and you know, you're afraid people are gonna try to pick them apart because you said something wrong. Uh, it's scary and everything else, you review it you know, 10 times before you send it out. Um, but it's tremendously rewarding. So those of you who are interested in it, I, I, you know, I encourage you to, to look into it and step into it. Um, here's the things that I think of that I think you should keep in mind if you're going to, if you're thinking about that. One is you have to take it very seriously that the internet is a surveillance system. That's what the internet is these days. It sucks. Uh, I, you know, I'm back from the early days of the internet when we really had such high hopes for it before Google and Facebook and Microsoft and the others bastardize the whole damn thing. Uh, there's still hope for the future, uh, but right now the internet is a surveillance system and everybody who uses the normal ways will be surveilled at all times. That is the one place you can be absolutely sure you will be surveilled. And bear in mind that Tor is not magic either. You have to use Tor the right way. By, Tor has to be used by competent people to do it really well. So Tor is not magic either. So let me begin with that warning. Secondly, you've got to be serious about justice and law. And that is, you've got to spend professional levels of time paying attention to this and learning and reading the important books, uh, reading, uh, again, the maxims of law that we have, uh, reading about the history of law, reading how it works, reading what happened in the early Middle Ages, what worked in that sort of situation. Uh, these are all really important things. Uh, so you have to do the work. It's hard. You've got to take it as a job and take it as a serious professional. Otherwise, you know, things are going to fall through cracks and it'll be a bit of a mess. You have to have a certain tolerance for being disliked. Um, nobody likes it, but you have to have a certain tolerance for you put out an opinion and people may say bad things about you and you've got to take it. Uh, sucks. Uh, those stupid opinions will be gone after a certain amount of time and you'll go on. And most people, although they don't say anything, will respect you. Um, so you have to have a certain tolerance for that. Another thing is you're gonna to have to become a well-rounded person. Sometimes that comes from just living a long time. There's a reason why they always picked old people to be judges. But you can also develop it a lot quicker if you happen to have been a rich kid, start hanging out with the poor guys. Start hanging out with uh, construction workers and immigrants. Uh, if you're from the other side, start hanging out with the, with the rich guys. Go to the cocktail parties, go to the things, learn how they behave, learn what's on their mind. You want to become a well-rounded human being. Because especially as you get into mediation, this is necessary. You've got to read psychology. You've got to find what people want. You've got to find what, what's important to people. You've got to understand these things. This is not a trivial job. We can, any reasonably intelligent person, if they want to put the time and effort, can do it. But you've got to put in the time and effort. Um, you have to be flexible. You find out that people who are rigid uh, are the worst people in the, in the practices of law. 
uh, that's the rule. That's what we do. That's what I said, and I'm sticking to it. If you don't want to do it my way, you know, there's the door and all that type of hard ass stuff, intellectual hard ass stuff, uh, intellectual hard assery. Um, it's a mistake. It doesn't work. Uh, it, it will mess things up. So definitely you have to be flexible. You have to not try to be a hard ass that will destroy your practice of law. Um, I really recommend that everybody learn Marshall Rosenberg's uh, principles of negotiation. It usually goes under the, the term nonviolent communication. Uh, Marshall, no relative that I'm aware of, uh, wrote all of these, developed all these principles in the 60s and the 70s. And it's, you need to learn how he negotiated. Uh, he had a particular very simple way of doing it. But if you learn how to do it his way, you can get to conclusions really, really well and get out of situations with everybody being not too unhappy and back to work. So I highly recommend that. Uh, and again, one last thing is that mediation is so much better than verdicts. Um, a verdict is kind of hard assery. It's, it's kind of, uh, this is what it is. And the community will, will enforce it if it's legitimate. And if you make the case well, uh, people, people ostracize and it works. Uh, if, you're, if you're a bad guy and all of a sudden you're exposed and you don't fix it, people stop doing business with you. And if people stop doing business with you too much, you don't eat. So um, ostracism really does work. Uh, you have to not get crazy about it. And people don't, uh, not in our experience. Uh, people just stop doing business with guys who are jerks and they lost their power, they lost their whatever. Um, so I suppose in conclusion, I wanna tell you that we did this. We did it uh, between oh, 2000, 2002, uh, even maybe, a, no, I think it ended about then. It worked really well. It worked against some really strong odds and it would be easier to do it nowadays and it's a, the more we get into a crypto economy, a, an anonymous sort of economy, the more this is necessary. Uh, and I encourage all of you to uh, take it seriously. Thanks so much. Earlier, I don't know if you were watching the two lawyers uh, from Slovenia that, that were on before you, uh, if you were no. watching you live stream or, or anything. Um, so, we were talking about, so uh, so a couple of lawyers are saying, yeah, look, we want to talk to the blockchain and, and, and crypto people. And, you know, we have our intertribal conflicts. You have your intertribal conflicts, but we'd like to see a lot more, a lot more cross dialogue yeah, and, and integration. And so I raised the question about, um, so this, this uh, <clears throat> necessity for us to build systems that legacy law regimes done, accept, recognize, and then create precedential law based on. How do you, how do you feel about that? Um, In scope of where does your- accept us when they want to. Yeah, they can accept us when, when they're ready to accept us and I'm not gonna change a damn thing to make them like us more because their model and our model are not at all the same. And if we try to build according to their model, and we care so much about getting them to accept us, we're going to, we're going to blow it. We need to do our thing. We can be cooperative with them. We can be kind and sharing even with them, but we don't change our model. Our model is, is ours, and we don't compromise our model in order to get them to like us. We don't suck up to power. Uh, to lawyers, individual lawyers, there are, they can be our friends. Um, to even legal associations, they can be our friends. But we are, have our model and they have theirs and that's okay and we'll, we'll cooperate as far as we can uh, with everybody, just we don't change our model to make people like us. 
Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I guess that's so that that um, we allowed ourselves to be co-opted uh, in the first in the first round, right? Yeah, we don't want to do that. We have our principles are different, and they're better, and we don't compromise them for what? To get to get a payday to try to play Mark Zuckerberg? No, thank you. Yeah, I think that I think that's a that's a pretty good way to to end the talk. <laughs> why com why compromise? <laughs> we have a better thing, you know. We're going to compromise and what? Shortchange our grandchildren? Oh, no thanks. Paul, brother, thanks for coming, man. My pleasure.